Well, hey, welcome back to the HC Conversations podcast. I'm Phil. You are not Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's staying in there. Oh, I'm Phil. <laughs> and I'm Paul, not <laughs> Phil. All right, oh. just want to see if you guys are on your toes today. Yes. But today we are back with another episode, continuing on uh, with the conversation that we kind of began last time. But oh, yeah. We're like, hey, we're going to expand on this one idea and you could say that today all hell is going to break loose Ooh, i see podcast. what you did there nice play on words paul yeah that's right because we're going to talk about hell some more mm-hmm. we started talking about it last week yeah. um you know last week we kind of talked about the or not last week we don't do one of these last month if we don't do one of these once a week we could not do that we would die <laughs> we run out of ideas and time uh last month is this kind of like the exclusivity of jesus and what about people who don't know jesus are they all going to hell and like well, well what is hell exactly and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more this week but just in way of recap, what is hell, Paul? What would you say hell is? Uh, hell is something of our own making. Ooh, something so that we speak. unleash, yes. Something, something that we unleash on earth. Um, as we look at the, at the b- biblical narrative, you know, what we were supposed to create in partnership with God, mm. uh, Adam and Eve, and if they would have partnered with God like they were supposed to, mm-hmm. unleashing uh, heaven on earth. Yeah. You know, that overlap of God space and human space. But instead, we decided that we wanted to go our own way. And that's a decision that everybody makes. Mm-hmm. And in doing so, instead of partnering with God, we instead partner with ourselves, with other spiritual beings. Ooh, evil spiritual and beings. And we unleash hell on earth. This is true. So, so Jesus came to get the hell out of us. Oh, that's right. Tim Mackey said that one I time. Know, I was like, did. oh, that's so That's good. A good, because he's like, he did not come to get us the hell out of here, but get the hell out of us. And it's like, da, da, da. Okay. Um, yeah, I like that. Uh, that the sin and evil that we unleash infects God's good earth. And then the part that people tend to think about when it comes to hell, that has eternal implications. Right. Right? Like there's a trajectory. And this is, so if you're a Christian or a follower of Jesus, faith in him, or you like you rejected that, uh, there's a trajectory that your life is on right now that continues into forever, mm-hmm. right? And so it's not uh, it's not a surprise at the end of the at the end of the road. You're like, oh no, I didn't know. It's like no, this is this is the direction I was going, and that direction is just continuing. Um, but yeah, so it kind of boils down to that idea. So often the question is asked, why does God send people to hell? He doesn't. Right. It's something that we choose, we choose. in the end. C.S. Lewis um, famously said, you, you, oh, "I've actually got the quote. Okay, I mean, you can ahead. you can summarize if you want." But I, I can just, I can read it. You just read it. Okay, so this is from uh, the Great Divorce, which is, you know, it's a work of fiction. But he paints this very vivid uh, kind of picture of what uh, hell looks like, um, and uh, he says this. In the long run, the answer to those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question: What is it that they're asking God to do? To wipe out all past sins and at all costs give them a fresh start? He did that on the cross to forgive them, but they don't want forgiveness. To leave them alone, that's what hell is. It's God saying, I'm fine. If you want me to leave you alone, I will leave you alone. Okay, so that's what hell is. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. Mm. Right? And so I think it was also Lewis that said, or someone who was picking up on his line of thinking that said that the, 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 the doors to hell or the gates to hell are locked from the inside. Right. right? It's not God locking us in, but no, brother. We locked ourselves in because we don't want God. We don't want mm-hmm. his presence. Mm-hmm. So do, do you want to go there then for a second, what we just talked about out there? Sure. Because I brought it up. So I kind of have to. Keeps, keeps, yeah, a little screwdriver or something. You know. um, so there's this interesting, and, and like sometimes the discussion on things like hell gets very philosophical because uh, there's not, there's not like a ton of like scriptural, like here's exactly what it is. It's like, no, there's some things that are uh, a little bit ambiguous. Um, so this is more in the philosophical realm, but... The gates are locked from the inside. So the question is, uh, in hell, in that state of separation from God in eternity or whatever, can a person, are they, are they actually able to get out of hell, but they just choose not to, or they're not able to do it. That'll make your head hurt for a while. Mm -hmm. What say you, what say you? (laughs) Well, if, uh, somebody is in hell because they, they chose to be there, Mm. um, and looking at what scripture says um, and just kind of like the church is teaching on salvation and the work of the spirit in the mm-hmm. believer that it is God's spirit that brings us to the repentance that it's it's God working 
through his spirit to draw us to himself. It's not something that we can do on our own, um, but ultimately it's, it's God that mm-hmm. does that. Right, so right, if right. God is removing that spirit, that helper, um, that, that source of life from right. people and from somebody's ability to experience God's spirit, then mm-hmm. I would say, no, they have no chance of getting out right. of hell because there isn't the ability right. because it's a place without God. It's like they could, but they won't. Right, right. It's, yeah, I, I, it's it's just interesting about. Either way, it's like no, they're not going to leave. But uh, again, the question basically is: is it locked from the inside or the outside? Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, so hell, it's it's a fun topic. Separation right. from God. Right. What we what we want to do over the course of this podcast is kind of lay out um, and then talk about where we would land on the three because there are three major views or camps uh, uh, on hell within. Christianity. Mm-hmm. All right. So that, that's an, that is an important distinction to, to make. All three of these things that we're going to talk about are Orthodox Christian beliefs right. that there have been people throughout church history who have been in each one of these different camps. And these are people who love Jesus, who are filled with his spirit, who are like, but they arrive at different places on this. So uh, if you feel the need to send us angry email, you can do that and we will read it politely and say thank you for your input but probably won't change our minds <laughs> no, no i've got a question yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah yeah as we're we're talking about the doctrine of hell mm-hmm. do you think that it's important to have a doctrine of hell that it's necessary for under understanding salvation that hell makes the hmm. picture of salvation hmm. more appealing no because i and, and i think we'll probably talk about this a little bit that if you need a certain picture of hell to present the good news of the gospel or salvation, then what we are selling people is fire insurance rather than like loving Jesus, right? Um, like where it's, it's punishment based in terms of like, oh, I, I want to put my faith in Jesus and trust him because I just really, I really don't want, I don't want to go to hell versus I want to put my faith in Jesus and because I, I, I don't want, I don't, hell or whatever, I don't want anything else if I don't have him, mm-hmm. right? And so I, I would say, when you see the beauty of Jesus, it's like he's not, he's not a, uh, a consolation prize, you know, he's not your ticket out of hell. It's like, no, I just, I just want him. I don't care about any of the other options. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's, that's what I would maybe land Okay. On. I don't know. I was just curious, because um, I know some people might be wondering that. Uh, mm. The other thing that I want to, before we dive into the three perspectives, is just God's justice. Mm. Uh, Because you look at Mm -hmm. other cultures and they are very much, they like to see God's justice. Oh, yeah. In the United States, Western Christianity, we don't like talking about God's justice. Not so much. Um, Well, unless his justice looks just like my justice. Right. (laughs) But in other cultures, it's so important to have uh, that picture of God's justice, of God being the one that will ultimately settle the score. That it's not up to me, but it's up to God to make things right, mm-hmm. whatever that looks like, mm-hmm. whether it's sending people, and I, I just said sending people, Look, we but don't allowing, have a, allowing, we don't have a better word, <laughs> allowing people to choose hell mm-hmm. versus, you know, offering them salvation. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I think it's important to, yeah. to say that there are distinctives and that there are different cultures that place uh, a greater emphasis on the justice of God. Yeah. It's, it's a very modern and Western thing to have a problem with the idea of, of hell. Right, where it's just like, uh, because you know, we, we, we have this claim too that God is loving and God is good, but He cannot be loving and good if He's not just. Right, like if, if, if there is not some sort of like punishment, some sort of um, uh, like cause and effect for okay, s- like sin and evil have infected this world, we cannot say He is good if it's like, eh, whatever, it's not right. that big of a deal. Um, yeah, so I think it kind of comes down to a lot of times we're like, no, we like justice, but again, our definition of it, and usually the line on what deserves, you know, punishment or what's justice and what's not is just on the other side of what I do and how I live. Right. (laughs) Yeah, I think this takes us back to our previous episode where we were talking about the question, so you think God is going to send me to hell? No, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, X, Y, and Z. Right. And it's like, okay, well, it depends on your picture of hell and what you Mm -hmm. think hell is, and that brings us now to our conversation of the different perspectives. Right. So let's, let's name the different perspectives. Okay. Talk about, uh, I guess the, the, the two that 
we would probably disagree with mm -hmm. and then maybe unpack one that we do land on. Okay. And again, before we get in, like, Christians believe different things and it's okay. It's really okay. In right. fact, like you, you can love Jesus and we can have disagreements. You can be part of this church and we can have disagreements. Right. Because the doctrine of hell is not one of the essential things of the faith. Right. It's like, Hey, we, we don't, we, anyway, right. All the, all the essentials. We're on board with the essentials. Uh, all right. So the three, uh, perspectives mm -hmm. that are again, orthodox perspectives that Christians have believed for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Um, eternal conscious torment or ECT, ECT, for short. uh, Christian universalism or unlimited atonement and annihilationism or terminal punishment. Yes. So let's start with ECT because it's the fun one. Yeah. So this <laughs> this is the one that probably gets the most airtime in the United States. Unfortunately, it's one that's most co popular. Uh, probably because it's easy to draw or depict in art. Literally to draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's the one that you see on billboards. Mm -hmm. uh, where you see like, <laughs> flames and stuff. I'm, I'm thinking of a very specific billboard right now. Uh, um, and the road that it's on. I might, it might be down now. There might be a different one now, but I remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, if you haven't picked up, this is one that has to do with fire... And brimstone and pitchforks and pitchforks and, and, and yeah. devils with little horns on them it's subterranean torture chambers yes like underground being tortured forever and ever hence the name eternal mm -hmm. and conscious you're aware of it and you're experiencing it and you're feeling it torment mm -hmm. um yeah and as as you've already been kind of alluding to um it's uh it, it comes almost entirely from tradition not scripture right um although there's some scriptural evidence and we'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit but um this really became popular like uh, during like the medieval time mm -hmm. right that that's when this really uh, and we we can thank um dante mm -hmm. right dante's, dante's inferno. inferno this is where so much of this imagery comes from and somehow and i don't know how like this became the predominant like cultural version of it other than the fact that it's like it's dramatic you know it sells. It's easy to put on art. And it's good for controlling Ooh, the masses. Ooh, it's very good. Yes, it's very um, fear-based. Fear when based. the church and the state are one, and you're trying to get people to uh, to pay their indulgences. Mm. I mean, this is good Wait. at getting people to pay their indulgences. Wait a minute, Paul. Are you telling me that fear sells and can control people? Yeah. Oh. It's like What a revelation that <laughs> is. Because it's like we're still doing that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so it, it, it does come a lot from tradition and it comes from, we talked about this a little bit, taking, uh, a very literal approach to passages like verses of scripture that talk about hell, mm -hmm. you know, so things like fire. Right. Um, but we talked last week, it's like, okay, but understand what is, what is fire? The picture of fire in, uh, in the scripture is always a sign or a, an image of God's judgment. And it's more of a, it's not, it's not a punishment. It's a purification. purification. It's purifying. It's removing what shouldn't be there to bring about a pure and good thing. Um, and then we have that, you know, juxtaposed with passages that talk about hell is like darkness. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, it can't be fire and darkness. Right. And so eternal conscious torment very much takes a very literal, uh, like, and not literal in the sense of what the author meant, but like in our mind of like a picture in my head of what this would look like. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a couple of passages, just roll through them. Um, there are, uh, you know, maybe a handful, two to three verses really that would support the idea, like directly support the idea of eternal conscious torment. One of them is in Matthew 25 says that they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Mm -hmm. So see, there you go. It's eternal punishment and it's eternal life. Right. And then there's passages, uh, throughout the scriptures that talk about, hell mm -hmm. uh and that's actually there's better translations now that talk about going yes. down to the grave that's a really good of, point instead of mm -hmm. hell mm -hmm. um you see sheol the grave it's yep. just so everybody just died yeah everybody, it's just the realm of the dead the realm of the dead and so often in the ancient near east they had garbage dumps mm -hmm. where there was an eternal fire because it, was it just burned day mm -hmm. and night so that became the picture of the grave yeah. of gehenna Right. So like, as you're saying there, um, that the, the idea of like the grave or whatever. So like in older translations, especially the old Testament, there's no, there's not really any indication or idea of like life after death. It's like, mm -hmm. you're just in the realm of the dead. I think the old King James would render, uh, either like Sheol or Hades, like the realm of the dead mm -hmm. as hell. Yeah. Um, but that's not what that, that word means. It's just, it's the Greek idea of Hades right. or Sheol in the Old Testament. It's like, again, it's the realm of uh, the realm of the dead. And you picked up on Gehenna, 
which was an actual, that is where we get, like, when Jesus is talking about, when he says hell, it's this word Gehenna, which is this burning trash dump. And again, that's not to say, because some people will go to the extreme, we can get to that in one of these other points, that so hell is just an image, it's not something real. It's him taking something that his audience knew. Mm -hmm. You know that big flaming trash dump over there? And there's all kinds of history behind that, which we might get into. Like, that's this picture that he has of hell. So, uh, yeah. So that eternal, that, that, that verse from Matthew, eternal punishment, eternal life, um, revelation, the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting one. This might be one of the best cases for eternal conscious torment, where it's talking about this lake of fire that's been made for Satan and his angels. Right. And then there's some language about people, and there's just this general, and they will be tossed into the lake of fire. And it's like, wait, who's the they there? Mm -hmm. Is it people or is it? Satan and his angels. Um, so, and then there's also the, the, you know, the idea of eternal. So like we we'll see eternal punishment and depending on the lens through which you read scripture and you'll see our lens in a minute as we get to another one, the question then becomes like, wait, when the author says eternal, do we mean that the punishment is lasting forever, eternal in that sense, right. or that the effects of the punishment last forever? It's permanent would be another way of saying that. And you can read it either way. It's like, right. again, what lens are you looking at this through? And so it's not as cut and dry as we, we tend to think. Right. Um, um, and whenever we see the lake of fire, uh, it's not a place where the devil has created or is no. like has control over. It's something that God created yeah. for the devil and his angels. Yep. Yep. Not for people. So. Um, right. And so, yeah, some of that, like, the, the, again, the, the permanent language, like even the imagery that's used, it's like, you know, they will be... Uh, utterly destroyed mm -hmm. it's like well and again we get into phil philosophy because it's like it's not super clear so these are philosophical questions but can something be utterly destroyed forever right. it's like wait it, once it's destroyed it's just kind of just like it's gone or com completely burnt up you know that imagery of fire again it's like well once it's burnt up it's burnt up and so you know you just got to play with the ideas it's like what's, be what's being communicated here right. and there's pictures uh, or passages that talk about the place where the worm never dies <laughs> So it's and like the worm, the worm is just munching on you forever, but you're also being burned forever. Yeah. So it's apparently they're like fireproof worms. Fireproof worms. But somehow you regenerate because right. like it just, yeah. So again, appreciating and understanding the imagery. So eternal conscious torment, that's the first one. And there are a handful of passages that might push us in that direction. Mm -hmm. What's the one, the, the next one that... Uh, we would probably not land on and say there's a handful of passages for uh, Christian universalism or yes. unlimited atonement. Unlimited atonement. So this is the perspective that the Jesus's death paid for the sin of all mankind. Uh, this isn't. This is different from regular like universalism. Yeah, it's which not. Is it's like not all roads, roads lead, God. lead to God. Right. No, this is. There is one road that leads to God. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. But Jesus's death was powerful enough to save everyone. everybody. Yes, even like post death like there will, there will come a point where you would the love of jesus is so overwhelming that like after you die you're like i was wrong and i want to follow you mm -hmm. um and you know it's interesting and, and i kind of think every christian should have this perspective of like i don't think universalism is the best case but i am a hopeful universalist mm -hmm. like i hope that's true i don't think it is mm -hmm. but i hope it's true and i think if you're a follower of jesus we should all hope that's true but not necessarily thinking that it is. And so there's a handful of verses that could be used for that as well. Um, like where, where Paul talks about the effects of sin and he talks about how everyone has died in Adam, like the first man who sinned. But then he says because of, uh, but, but everyone also lives now in Christ because mm -hmm. of, of his death. It's like, wait, that sounds like all. He says all have sinned in Adam and all are now counted righteous in Jesus okay so that that could be kind of universalist language mm -hmm. um the language of and every knee will bow and every tongue confess and so those are some of the ideas that pick up the uh yeah the universe where, where a universalist would go and say see like everyone will be saved through jesus whether in this life or the next mm -hmm. anything to add to that no yeah no nothing to add okay so we've hit eternal conscious torment we've hit universalism and we would probably say and again, there are Christians, faithful Christians that believe these and that there are a handful of verses that uh, would support those positions. Um, but we don't think it's the best explanation of the overall story right. of Scripture. And this is where, just as a general principle, when we engage with Scripture, um, 
oftentimes because of maybe how we've been taught to read the Bible or what faith was, we don't do a good job at, at seeing things in light of the whole story. Mm -hmm. It's like isolated. See, this verse says this, but it's like, wait a minute, what, what's the story that we're in? You know, what, what part right. of the story? How does this fit into the overall narrative? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we would, we would say that the, the one we're about to talk about, we think fits the overall narrative of scripture, who God is, what he's doing throughout history, the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is annihilationism or terminal punishment. This is that hell is real. Yep. But it's separation from God. Yep. Um, that it's 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 and that's the punishment is you are separated from God. But there comes a point where you just cease you to exist. You just cease to exist, yes. and that's punishment enough. Is that you don't get to experience uh, just the the life giving presence of mm -hmm. living with God. Yeah. For eternity. Yeah. Um, punishment is not something that you uh, that is necessarily done to you. It is what you miss out on. Right. Right. Yeah. And because you're separated from God, who is the source of life, you cannot be sustained apart from His life-giving self. And so you just. Um, and again, like the question is, well, well, how long is that punishment? Like, is I think there is some period of punishment because God is just and evil has to be punished. But it's like, but eventually, yeah, I, I would say that people just go out of existence. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of, uh, like I said, good um, scriptural evidence for that. Maybe not like direct verses, but in light of the whole story. Right. Because so. whenever we first open up the pages of scripture mm -hmm. and you know, we see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what they were created for, mm -hmm. and then being banished from the source of life, yeah. from the, the tree of good yeah. uh, and the tree of life, yeah. Tree of, the tree of knowledge and, and the, the tree, tree of life, of life yeah. um, being separated from that. But then scripture is the, the, the story of scripture is trying to bring us back, back to that there. Yeah. Uh, so we have this picture of <clears throat> life outside of the garden and separation from God and the death that results. Yeah. Um, and when Adam and Eve are first created, they're created from the dust. And the author mm -hmm. is saying they're created mortal they're beings. Mortal they're not beings. created to be eternal beings. Yes. They were created to be eternal beings. They wouldn't, God wouldn't be afraid for them to eat from the tree of life. Right. So like, and th there's an interesting note there that we don't often think of. Sometimes we get this picture and again, because we're not necessarily, you know, we're, well, we're definitely not ancient Israelites. Okay. <laughs> and so we're like, God formed them out of dust. It's like, well, you can't actually form dust. Like dust just falls through your hands. Okay. There is a word for clay that would make more sense, you know, or, or clay in the potter's hands. They could have used that word. They did not use that word because the dust is like, it's mortality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's in the book of Job, uh, where later it says, from dust you were, you came, and to dust you will return. Right. It's like, you're just a, <laughs> bad news, humans, we're just dirt creatures. <laughs> like, we're not, it, it, yeah, we're not immortal by nature. Right. Um, and like you were just saying before I cut you off, sorry, uh, that okay. the punishment is, you know, that they, they eat from the tree of knowing good and evil, and so God says, we need to get them out of the garden lest they eat from the tree of life mm -hmm. and live forever. Live forever in that fallen state. In that fallen and broken state. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, wait a minute. I thought humans were immortal. Why do we need a tree of life to live forever right. if we're immortal? And then talking about just this this dualism uh, yeah. where you know humans have a, a soul and a body and you know the soul goes on to live forever. That's not a perspective that you find in the Jewish scriptures that comes from Greek philosophy and Greek thought mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of the early Christian thinkers were influenced by mm -hmm. uh, that was used to then develop you know, things like et eternal conscious torment. Right, because um, if you have a soul that lives on forever, you've got to do something with it. Right, yeah. versus the Jewish perspective is, no, we live and then we die. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> we live in the... And, and so, like, the historical part of that, that we, like, the Greek dualism you know, we can't forget that Christianity is birthed out of Judaism. It is the fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Jesus is Jewish. He's the Jewish Messiah. But as the movement took off this beautiful thing, like it like went to the Gentiles really, really fast. And it became way more Gentile than Jewish, like mm -hmm. within a short amount of time. And so you got all these people coming from Greco Roman thought. Right. And you know, anytime we, whether this is coming into the church, you know, Christianity or anything in life, we don't just leave everything before a point behind us. It's like, no, we, we bring, we bring some of that mm -hmm. in and that began, began to really, really shape, you know, Christian thought 
it very early on um, for someone like, you know, like Augustine. It's like, you can see this all throughout like his writing. Like, man, Augustine is great. He's just beautiful stuff. And like church father, like just great, you know, but it's like, yeah, but he was like, he came out of this weird Greek culture, this dualistic mm-hmm. way of thinking. And um, so, yeah, I, the first step of embracing annihilationism, I suppose, is that recognition that humans by our nature, like the way we are created, we are not eternal beings. Right. We are mortal beings. Yes. Like that is a gift that is given by God. Right. And so talking again about the Jewish perspective, they recognize that and their hope was resurrection one day. Mm -hmm. They had that hope. There's passages throughout the Old Testament that talk about that and and waiting for the Messiah to come Mm -hmm. and waiting for the day of the Lord, God's judgment. Mm -hmm. And um, Which images of fire, by the way, day of the Lord. (laughs) Images of fire. Um, And then as we move forward to the death and resurrection of Jesus, Mm -hmm. it's partially why it was so shocking for the Jewish people because they knew that humans were just mortal. Yeah. That once you were dead, that was it. They, were, they weren't like, oh, but Jesus's spirit is still, you know, floating up in the clouds right. playing a harp. It's <laughs> so like, no, Jesus, Jesus would be a mad harpist, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just, he'd be shredding on that harp. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's why it was so shocking then yeah. whenever G- there was resurrection mm-hmm. um, because they didn't expect that yeah. because they didn't have a category for, for that dualism. It was just, no, you go to the grave. Yeah, and, and that doesn't just affect our perspective on hell. It's also, you talk about resurrection, it affects our perspective on heaven as well. Like, you know, we're not going to exist in a disembodied state mm-hmm. because that's not how humans were, that's not how God made humans. It's like, no, you were physical creatures made to live on a physical earth. And as long as you're in relationship with me, you can live forever. Right, because in, in Genesis, as we talked about the, those first chapters, we see the tree of life Mm -hmm. and we see god showing up in different places being that tree of life psalm Mm -hmm. 1 talks about Mm -hmm. uh, becoming like trees of life planted by planted by streams of water yeah god is that source of life Mm -hmm. we see a tree of life uh in revelation that yeah the nations nations come come and and can eat of this tree again and then have access to god again being that tree of life yes being hung on a tree, that, yes. that tree that brought death to him, brought life mm-hmm. to so many. So humans are ever only immortal when they have access to like this kind of symbolic tree. Is it a real tree? Is a symbolic tree? It's like, what, that doesn't matter. The point is, it's only when you have access to this tree of life that you live forever. Mm-hmm. It's there in the garden. It's a gift that God gives. It's going to be there at the end of the story in Revelation as the nations come again when there's the new heavens and the new earth. And standing in the middle... You know, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. That verse from the Old Testament that seems so obscure, and then you see Jesus on a cross. That that now becomes the tree of life that we we eat of. You know, and then it's like, oh man, there's this imagery then of like, okay, like Jesus, he's the vine, and and we're the branches. This is my body; it's broken for you. Eat of it. This is my blood poured out for you. Drink of it. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. It's like he is this new source of life. Yeah, it's cut. It's like. Come and eat from the tree of mm-hmm. life again. Yeah, and so and so th- this is the picture that we have, right? Humans are immor- not immortal by nature. We are we are finite. We are mortal. We will die. We need access to a tree of life. But we're kicked out of the garden. We're cast into the, the the realm of exile and death. And you know, there's these moments in the Old Testament where these there's these temporary like little trees, like oh, God's word is like nourishing, and you have the, the there's tree imagery in the temple and in the mm-hmm. tabernacle. But then Jesus shows up, and there's this unexpected tree, right? Like it's like, it's a cross. It's this upside down kind of picture. And ultimately it leads to revelation that we're waiting someday for him to return. Um, and so we only are immortal when we have access to that. And so then for those of us that are Christians have said, yes, I want to eat of that tree, right? I'm putting my faith Mm -hmm. in Jesus. I have eternal life. But if I don't have like eat of that tree, I don't have eternal life. Right. So what happens to that person? Well, they die. Right. Their punishment is death. It's eternal death. The, the most famous verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes will not die, but will have eternal life. Mm-hmm. Right. Not that whoever, and now I'm getting a little aggressive, not whoever believes will not, you know, uh, suffer eternally, but will have eternal life. No, will not die. 
Like death is what awaits humanity without mm-hmm. the gift of life from God himself. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So that's where we land. And that's yep. kind of our reasoning why we land there. Mm-hmm. Um, but wherever you land, we want you to know that you can fall into one of these three camps that Christians have believed these things for thousands of years or scriptural support for it. And that it's okay. We can still be brothers in Christ mm-hmm. at the end of the day yep. because of that. And, and back to what you kind of asked me at the beginning, all three views, it's like, it's not about what we get out of. Mm-hmm. It's about getting Jesus, yep. right? It's like, well, if I'm, an, if I'm an eternal conscious torment person, like my motivation for faith in Christ is not so I don't go to hell. It's so that I can be with Jesus. Right. If I have a universalist perspective and it's like, yeah, maybe everybody's going to get there, but I don't want to miss out on knowing Jesus now. So I want to be with him now, mm-hmm. not just then. And if you know, you're a universalist or excuse me, like a, um, annihilationist, it's like, well, I don't want to miss out on the, the eternity on the new heavens and the new earth. I want to be with Jesus. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So at the end of the day, it's about Jesus. Yep. Always is. Mm-hmm. Always is here at hope community. We That's try, right. we try to anyway, we try to <laughs> inspire people to follow Jesus. And we hope that this podcast maybe helped you take another step in your faith journey yeah. uh, and draw closer to Jesus. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can drop them below if you're watching on YouTube or email us at info at hopecommunityonline.org. Um, and that's it. We'll, that's it. We'll be back next month okay. with another podcast. All right. See ya.